this is San Diego Media Pros. I'm the, the Vice President of SD Media Pros, uh, and I'm glad to have you joining us tonight for a great discussion with uh, some folks that have been uh, in the industry, both creating content and helping others learn the craft, um, and we're going to hear more from them later. Uh, but first, uh, it's always great to check in on uh, what is the latest in our industry, what is some um, uh, information that we can put to use. And for that, we always turn to Mark Mazenov for news you can use. Please take it away, Mark. Thank you uh, very much, Robin, for the great introduction. Yes, let's hope this is news you can use. At least that's the way it's labeled, and we will find out how much of it you can use at the end. So we'll go ahead and take off at the moment here with our news that you can use. We, uh, we begin with something that some of you youngins may not recognize, but this came from a program uh, at the very beginning when Superman came out and it was the great line that says look up in the sky It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Well today it's a drone and that's what we're looking at today is the drone and why because Not long ago the FAA launched this, the, these new rules for drones and what they're mainly saying is it's kind of this the first big set of changes since they uh, Decided that yeah, we ought to get involved in this. It's part of the remote ID standard uh, and the biggest change is that effective in 2023 for drones weighing over 0.55 pounds or uh, 0.25 kilograms, you must broadcast the location of both you and your drone. Your, you and your drone, that's you, the pilot, with an ID number. So it can't just be the drone, it has to be, they have to know where you are. It doesn't have to have, come on all the time, but it has to somehow broadcast. And there's no grandfathering in this. So because you have the first drone ever made, you still have to have it wired out there somehow. Uh, with this. So that's the important thing. It doesn't matter whether it's it's a racing drone, a little drone, or whatever. It, you still have to be able to do this. But how they're going to do it is still not exactly known. A lot of different styles and manufacturers of, of what to do to retrofit and the ones going forward. So something to be aware of. But the good news uh, of this, and, and that, not that this is a, isn't bad news, but the kind of the good news of this is that uh, the new rules will allow you to fly over people. You can also fly at night and in some cases over moving vehicles without having to apply for an exemption. Of course, you'll need to have a special uh, training for the night flying and there are drone uh, uh, categories that go into this. So you'll certainly want to look into that. So for more information, you'll want to visit this site. You can look at it up here. It's FAA.gov news. And this will be on our, uh, our media page as well for you to, uh, to take a look at. Moving now to this fine picture. No, this is not the final battle on The Bachelor between Rachel and Michael as they woo Matt for that final rose. That's not what this is. No, this, ladies and gentlemen, is potentially the feel-good picture of the year. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. The movie-going confidence hits a highest level since the pandemic began. And uh, National Research Group's been surveying moviegoers on a weekly basis since the pandemic began to sort of see how they feel. And Thursday of last week was a milestone day. It was the first time since the pandemic crippled the theater, uh, theatrical experience that people who felt very or somewhat okay about buying a ticket hit the record of 57%, which was identical to a year ago. So what does that have to do with Godzilla vs. Kong, which has yet to be released? Well, it's right now tracking to be the strongest opening of a movie during the pandemic at $20 million, which will uh, outshine Wonder Woman 1984, which opened during the pandemic at $16.7 million over Christmas. So Godzilla vs. Kong could be that monster battle and everyone feels good about going back to the movie, so we're, we're pulling for you. You know, you can pull for your, your hero of choice in that one. And now we go to power to the people. And what do I mean? What do I mean by power to the people? Well, I want you to sort of look at this. Just take a look at this image. Absorb it. Feel what it must be like to wrangle all those ones and zeros into this puny portrait gallery. Just take a look. And why? Because this particular gallery, along with a few others, sold by Beeple, a first purely digital work done with a unique NFT at Christie's for $69 million. Now, what's odd is that the guy, Mike Winkleman, the, who's the digital artist known as Beeple, hadn't sold anything for more than a hundred bucks until he did this. Now, last week at this, this NFT uh, version of his work sold for the 69 million at Christie's. The sale positions him among the top three most valuable living artists, according to the auction house. Now, NFT is a non-fungible token 
and it's a unique file that lives on a blockchain, kind of like, uh, like Bitcoin, and they're able to verify ownership of the work of digital art. It is exceedingly difficult to explain, as if I knew what I was talking about. So you have to dive into it. Um, it's really, really, really mind-blowing. Um, but it's very interesting because the approach to creating and selling this digital arts really important for the thousands of artists who work in Hollywood. And what do I mean? Well, here's a quote from one of them. One of them. We don't get royalties in any movies, says Star Wars and Black Panther concept artist David Levy, who as vile art is selling his personal digital art as NFTs. If we stop work, we lose health insurance, we lose income. We never expected anything like this could happen, but now that it's here, we're not going to let it go. So if you want to know more about NFTs, and how they work you want to there's a great article on esquire what nfts are or you can ring up dj summit at summit work who knows all about this stuff is selling things right now and he may even speak to you unless one of his digital works sold recently for 70 million in which case you may have to go to his private island and and see if you can book a time with with him there it is springtime and spring fever and it's just exciting everyone's getting out everybody wants to put their new clothes on, including our fine friends at some of our great editing houses. And what do I mean? Well, they have been releasing new things this, this spring. It's like a record pace. And everyone's trying to get into the action. So first up, with all these great little updates, we have Premiere Pro uh, version 15, which dropped a couple weeks ago. And it's, its main highlights here, it has an auto reframe for different viewing formats. It has uh, captioning improvements and a soon-to-come transcription offering that is in there. And there's a scene edit detection. If you have a, uh, say, a commercial put in there and there's 10 or, or 12 edits in it, it can detect where those edits are and cut your, your uh, video up uh, accordingly. So that's a, a great little feature, plus a bunch of other things. So uh, Premiere is, is on top of it with their release. Not to be outdone, uh, Final Cut has recently uh, dropped 10.5. 5.2, I think, is their recent one now. And some of the things that are in there now runs, runs natively on the Apple Silicon, the Intel-based Mac computers, uh, has an automatic transcoding. So when you're copying, you're consolidating your media. So that's kind of a new, newer feature for them. And they also have a Smart Conform, which is just like the auto reframe in Final Cut Pro Speak. So it's a similar idea that will automatically take that cumbersome work out of, uh, of you to reframe, say, for your phone or an iPad or a square image. Uh, DaVinci Resolve has uh, version 17 that has dropped recently, and that's got uh, uh, a fast review for quick media checking. It has a, a turbo mode for you to look through your, uh, your footage uh, very quickly. It has a disabled timeline feature for improved performance. You turn off those timelines you, that may be loaded in, but you're not using, you turn that off and it can speed up the performance of, of DaVinci. And it has a render in place option where you can render your media and pop it right back in without having to drop it back in. So it's a neat little feature. And you know what, heck, even Media Composer 2021.2 is, is, has released something here. And uh, I can't tell you what it is because I don't, I no longer know what Media Composer does uh, anymore. I think there's maybe three people left in town who cut on Media Composer. So that that's, uh, that's where I are, but uh, I'll be aware that these are some of the great things that are coming down from, uh, from our fine folks who are working with us in our edit programs. And finally, we have tremendous news for those who shoot in the woods. So what do I mean by that? Well, no fees now or permits are needed for shooting on national park lands. This came down January 22nd, U.S. District Court ruling. Uh, determined that uh, fees and permits on national park lands are unconstitutional. So what does this mean? Well, low impact filming will not require special use permit or fees. So low impact is defined as a crew of five or less and all gear is carried. So that's important. You know, you can put your tripod on the ground and, and those things, but it generally has to be carried. You can't drive it in. So that's, that's awesome. You can just go in and shoot. You don't have to have a permit. However, if, you have non, if you're a non-low impact filming activity, uh, and, and you don't meet that low impact requirement, you will need a special use permit. And you have to do that at least 10 days in advance notice uh, riding to the park you want to shoot at is, is required. So good news, Cleveland National Forest, you know, Yosemite National Park, all these great national parks, you can just go shoot without having the hassle of, of that. And that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is news you can use for March 24th, 2021. Thank you so much, Mark. You're very welcome. Um, uh, anybody have any any comments or questions or follow up on on any of those new news items? 
uh, time ends. Raise a hand. Go for it. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm actually curious about the forest uh, mm -hmm. um, filming. Is that you said? I didn't catch all of it. You said only national forests, or is like, or every park? According to the article, it's national forest, national park lands. So whatever the National Park Service owns and operates mm. is under their jurisdiction. Doesn't count county parks or state. Whatever their jurisdiction is different. National park lands. Okay, That's just wanted is. to confirm. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it can be difficult sometimes to kind of understand those jurisdictions between national right, and yes. state and stuff like that. But hey, for Yosemite, for Yellowstone, for you know all those big, uh, you know yeah. Sequoia, all those that's fantastic. Uh, Greg, you have your hand raised too. You're muted. Yes, please clarify cl clarify for me there, Greg. Okay, right. there we regarding go. the new drone yes. rules. Um, uh, it's a very simple test uh, to advance. If you're currently 107, which is the commercial mm -hmm. license, if you, uh, there, it's a very simple test for renewal that begins in the middle of April. And there are a lot of really good uh, test prep programs online. It's, it's a really nice piece of advanced, uh, advanced work. And one of the principal manufacturers, DJI, is already working on a retrofit program uh, for those of us who have uh, drones uh, who don't yet have uh, this, uh, this tracking procedure. Nice. And as a drone operator, I think it's a great idea because you yeah. want to know who else is up in the air. Right. It's a good, it's a good call. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. I know there are people who like to fly anonymously. And how about the drone is flying over your backyard and you're going, who the heck is that? <laughs> uh, you know, now you might be able to figure that out. Yeah. Yep. I think right. I put Dan Cheatham's hand. I don't know if you saw that, Robin. Nope, I did not see it. It must have flashed by. Go for it, Dan. Hi, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. That ten-day advance notice is to go to whom? And it has to be that? in writing to the park in which you wish to shoot. So you'd have to contact, say, Yosemite. The ranger station usually is your best right. bet. So their office. Start from there. Yeah, I would start with the ranger station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and All right. We'll let and folks know as well that uh, the news you can use now has its own page web page on our website a blog, so uh, after Mark supplies me with the slides and my PA moves here, um, <laughs> we will uh, get those uh, posted so you can uh, check out all the links and everything that uh, Mark has uh, mentioned tonight. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, all right. So uh, if we have maybe time for one more question, and then uh, I think we'll move on to the next uh, segment of the show here. Uh, great. Uh, not seeing any new hands. Let's move right along. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jane Hare, uh, our president, uh, to make some of uh, initial announcements, uh, comments, and uh, tee up the rest of our program. Uh, Jane, over to you. Thank you, Robin. Hi, everybody. I'm Jane Hare. I'm the president of SD Media Pros, and we are so happy to have you joining us tonight. I'm looking out the window, it's still light, which is different from our last few meetings. And how wonderful is that? Tonight, we are gonna be talking about the business of video training. And I know that I have uh, taken a lot of trainings about video, as have many of you, and that I produce video about training, as many of you do. So I think this is gonna be an interesting discussion with Steve Martin and Mark Spencer of Ripple Training. I wanted to first introduce our board of directors, the team that keeps the wheels turning here for SD Media Pros. Uh, you've met Robin Martin, who is our VP. Uh, our secretary position is currently open and we're looking to fill that. Um, we do have some people we're talking to, so that's excellent. But if you have interest and have not expressed it yet, uh, about being on our board of directors, please um, send one of us an email and uh, you can contact us via the website. Uh, Bob Unger is our CFO. Jeff Trober is our webmaster. Kevin Marty is our expert at membership, all things membership. Uh, David Rains helps us with technology. Mark Masonov, as you just saw, is our specialist in everything news you can use. Tom Kinneman is our past president and our streaming guru behind the scenes. And Michael Wood is in charge of all of our social media. Uh, and I really wanna say how much I appreciate our board of directors. They are the ones who plan these meetings, 
who do everything that you see on the website and in the newsletter. And um, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't get our newsletter, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for that uh, via our website. It always has details of upcoming meetings. And I even noted a few things from Mark's um, news you can use that maybe we'll plug in there next month uh, with some additional details uh, if possible. Uh, I do want to mention that we have a special event coming up. This is something brand new that SD Media Pros is going to try. Um, we think it's going to be fabulous. And Bob Unger, I'm wondering if you can tell us about the event that's going to be happening on Wednesday, April 7th. Well, what many people here are technical geeks and we like gear, but then there are a lot of people that don't like gear. But for those that like gear, Sony is now coming out with the FX3. So we have scheduled a lunch and learn with Sony. So at noon on April 7th, so you can just sort of sneak away and come see what's up. We'll have a presentation by Sony on the FX3, the FX6, the FX9. And then we'll have someone specifically talking about the new AI that goes into autofocus. So when you're working on a gimbal or something like that, and you don't have somebody there tracking with you to do follow focus, how some of those new features can keep those shots intact. Followed by a bunch of Q&A. We will also collect questions ahead of time so you can have those answered as well. So the idea is that we can get some exposure to tech and not have to do it in a full day's program and sort of fill in some of the gaps between our regular meetings and presentations. So hopefully we can find a great deal of interest. And if so, we'll wind up with other vendors and other technical topics that we can fill in with a lunch and learn. Back to you. Thank you, Bob. So that is meant to be uh, about one hour starting at noon on Wednesday, April 7th. And we hope you'll join us for all of it or whatever part of it you can. Uh, we'll be sending out some details in an email about how to sign up and participate in uh, that technical conversation. Uh, now, I want to turn it over to Jeff Trober for just a minute to tell us about the Wednesday, April 28th meeting. Thank you, Jane. It's, uh, I'm excited about this meeting. We're going to go retro, very retro. And uh, how many of you remember the old television show Family Ties? And the uh, boyfriend, uh, who was the artist that worked in garbage, Scott Valentine. was uh, Nick was the name of the artist or the character, and Scott Valentine is the actor. And Scott is going to be coming on our meeting in April to talk about two things. He's going to talk a little bit about working in a Hollywood production. Um, Family Ties was shot with a four camera set. So he's going to talk about the difference between that and working on uh, single camera shoots because um, he's also worked in movies and lots of television as well. And these days he is doing things a little different. He is an investment banker working behind the scenes, has, a, has done some production, and he's working on an OTT, over-the-top streaming uh, network. Uh, he and his uh, partners are working on that. That is hopefully to launch later this year. What is really interesting about his over-the-top network is that they're going to focus on independent filmmakers. He, as he says, he wants the film to be the star, not the network. So uh, they'll be looking for content. So if you're an independent filmmaker, you're definitely going to want to tune in for uh, for this meeting because it's going to be great. Scott is on fire about this. Talk to him. Um, week or so ago about all this and he is just on fire and just excited about it sounds like a really great thing so um we hope you can join us to uh take a journey down memory lane and a look into the future as well so that's on uh wednesday april 28th thanks jane jeff it sounds fabulous and i don't i don't know who actually raised their hand for having watched family ties that was must see tv uh with michael j fox and meredith baxter bernie and michael gross um, and Scott Valentine as Nick was really the comic relief. He was yeah. hysterically funny. So I think it's going to be fun to hear from him about the dynamics of working on the show with those actors, but then also just hearing about what it was like to do a four camera program at that time. Yeah. And then of course his new venture. So yeah. Yeah, uh, Wednesday, April 28th uh, at the regular time. So we'll be sending out the information about that meeting as we usually do. So thanks, Jeff. Sure, You're thank you. That up. I know you were able to pull from a personal connection there. Yeah, so. Scott and I have known each other for a, a, 
<laughs> long time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yes, he is. It was great to talk with him, and uh, he's very excited about all this. So thank Good. you. Good. Thank you. All right, let's talk about building your business and your visibility. Uh, we are introducing two new initiatives. And um, Robin, we can share your screen with what we're calling Just a Minute. And this is a new monthly feature that we're hoping to start next meeting where we show your one minute videos with your favorite production tips and tricks. There's a lot of detail here on the screen. I'm not gonna go through it all. The basic um, concept is you shoot a one minute video about something you are an expert at or have learned along the way. Shoot it on your mobile phone or on professional gear as long as the quality reflects you as a media pro. And you may add a logo and your contact information at the end if you'd like. And then we are going to show those videos at our meetings and share them on social media. So it is a good way to build your profile uh, locally. And speaking of profile, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Another initiative that we are introducing is something called The Profiles. And this is a way for you to build your profile and visibility with other media professionals here in San Diego and elsewhere. Uh, we're going to send out a questionnaire via email. Um, it's gonna have some fun questions. And these are meant to be quick answers, 10 words or less. And then we are going to put those together with a photo that you submit and introduce those on our social media. Uh, and Robin, if you'll go to the next slide, this is just kind of a sneak peek at what this is gonna look like. So the photos were going to kind of um, transition to kind of a blue opacity. And then you can see that some of the questions, my last purchase at B&H were similar. And there's Robin's answer. Uh, Michael Woods, my first job in media was. Uh, Mark Mason, of an unexpected fact about me. You can, uh, I can see for mine, uh, I'm powered by our SDMP members. And uh, Jeff Trober, I believe he said, creating a winning title for um, a short film. So the intent is to share about six to 10 facts about you. So we hope that you will watch your email for the profiles questionnaire and then fill that out. It will not take you a lot of time. Uh, again, really 10 word answers is what we're looking for. So please join us in participating in the profiles and in our Just a Minute series. Um, let's move on. I think it's time to get to our program for tonight. Uh, just a quick reminder that SD Media Pros is a nonprofit professional organization. Uh, everything we're gonna be talking about tonight is for educational purposes. And when we get to the Q&A, we want to try to avoid talking about things like AB5 and other legislation. Um, let's keep it to our training and video training topic, as always. And uh, next, I'm going to introduce Tom Kinneman. He is our past president, and he is our streaming technology guru, and he is the member of the board who planned tonight's event. So Tom, take it away. Introduce our program and our speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jane. Um, it's always good to be able to reach out uh, to the community and, um, and be able to pull from places where you've had success, where you've um, had connections in the past. And Ripple Training is one of those places and two of, the, two of those people. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on Ripple Training and uh, who the guys are, um, here's the top of their web page. Um, they help people create better videos. You can see that they are expert trainers and they're focusing on Motion and uh, DaVinci and uh, Final Cut Pro amongst the various other things that they do. And I just want to um, give a little background on um, the guys here while I navigate a little bit here. Um, so here's uh, Mr. Spencer. <laughs> and here's, uh, where are you here? Let's find you here. Um, where's Steve? And here's... Uh, 
Steve. So there we go. The three of us should be up there all at once right now. So real quick, guys, um, I'm just going to read your bios just so people know uh, a little bit about you before we get going. Uh, Steve is the creative force behind uh, Ripple Training, and he's been using Final Cut Pro since 1999. Um, that's about when we all got started on it, right? Um, so he uses it for production. Uh, he has it and has introduced thousands of people to Final Cut Pro through his classes, workshops, and training products. Uh, he is also a consultant and is trained for Apple. Um, Adobe, Disney, Canon, Walmart, and other companies. And he is also a writer and producer and photographer. And Mr. Spencer here, Mark, uh, is a freelance producer, editor, motion graphic artist, trainer, and editor, uh, writer uh, based in the Bay Area. Uh, he produces tutorials and plugins based on Final Cut Pro 10, Motion, DaVinci Resolve for Ripple Training. His company, Day Street Productions, is a production and post-production studio focused on corporate training. He's also an author and for two different books or maybe more. Mark, you can fill us in on that a little bit more on Motion and Final Cut 10 with Peach Pit Press. Um, thank you and welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much for having us. So the, the basis of this, I, I think everybody wants to know where people got started. And uh, that's kind of where I want to start off. Uh, you know, when, when you guys were young and restless and were looking for uh, um, what you, obviously we're all driven by this itch to scratch, to be in production. Otherwise we wouldn't be involved. And I definitely have learned there's definitely a, a cut of DNA for people that are involved. So, Steve, let's start with you. Um, how did how did you get started in in the business of, of training? Well, I thought about it, and I actually created a short slideshow that's going to be much more interesting than just me talking about it. Oh, so if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, fun. there we go. Yeah, I think I think I think it'll be better. So I'm going to share my screen here, and let's see here. There we go. It's coffee with Stephen Mark. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Um, a nice little apple there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. Well, my kids long since knocked that off the sink. So, yeah. anyway, so um, as you mentioned, I started well with Final Cut back in 1999 when it was was introduced. And uh, just a little background: uh, that's the Final Cut Pro One box when they introduced when they brought it out. Apple kind of shocked the world. It was a sea change because Prior to 1999, the cheapest nonlinear editing system you could buy was $30,000. That was a media 100 and the Avid was 100,000. So Apple really um, created a category killer with this product. And it was just a box and a couple of CD-ROMs. And then uh, uh, there was a convergence of things happening because at the same time, Apple introduced the G3 Macintosh that allowed you to connect a Firewire-based video camera directly to the Mac. And some of you who've been around a while are very familiar with that camera. That was the first digital video camera. It was a DV camera you connected and you can literally suck in video that was digital from tape right into your G3 and edit it digitally in Final Cut Pro and spit it back out. It was, it was huge. I can't even tell you how big it was. In fact, so big and, and that uh, I was doing classes in Santa Monica and at standing room only, 200 people in the in a classroom. Uh, that there was it was so popular. So that kind of got us thinking. Well, I I was traveling around the country teaching Final Cut in New York, Chicago, everywhere, and I and I got old really fast traveling. So the genesis of Ripple Training was I've got to find a way to deliver this content in a more efficient manner. And around you know, the internet really wasn't a thing in 1999. It was just starting. It was burgeoning. So I like how can I do this? And I started you know, even with low quality quick time movies, start putting stuff up. And so that's how it started. Um, so the early days, as it were, um, I worked for a reseller in the San, in the San Fernando Valley and named, uh, was uh, Intelligent Media. Some of you may know this guy was sold a lot of hardware and he did systems integration. And then I look like, I look like 10 years old in that picture. Anyway, um, we did the very first like radio broadcast called DV Guys and we were doing streaming using QuickTime and talking about digital video. And then I, I did the very first 
this is my first foray into professional training. I did a, a, a eight VHS series called Final Cut Pro A to Z. And uh, we, re- we released that. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. And, and people bought a set and we used to sell them at NAB. And that's how uh, I introduced a lot of people to Final Cut Pro is through my um, VHS training. So in terms of, uh, this is where kind of Mark and I started converging our paths. Um, how I got my start, there, there was one question you asked Tom about what was your kind of breakthrough or breakout moment? Yeah, and- exactly. You know, what, you know, some, you know, somebody has to show favor at some point to right. help people get down the road. Well, it was kind of a happy accident because it's really interesting because I went to film school in Los Angeles. I worked for advertising company, but it's really weird because my passion was for teaching, teaching stuff. I liked taking the cookies from the top shelf and bringing them down to the bottom shelf. That was fun for me. And so one year I was at the DB Expo in Long Beach and I was teaching just like here. I had a bunch of computers and I was talking and someone from Apple came up and she was like, oh my gosh, we got to get you in front of more people. And so um, this, this person at Apple got me involved with the Apple Certified Training Program. And I started working on books and, and teaching up, uh, essentially training Final Cut instructors uh, to go all, all over the world and deliver certified training. And I'll, Mark and I have more to say on that later because that, that program is basically dead. And we'll explain why in a moment. But that's how we started. Uh, Mark was writing the books. And, and, uh, and, and then we were invited to teach at these shows. Like the big one was NAB. And this is literally Apple's classroom at, at NAB. And that's me about, you know, who knows, 15 years ago. And this is where I met Mark. Mark was doing motion and he was also one of the trainers that was invited by Apple to speak at their booth. And so we kind of got together about 15 years. I think it's 15 years now. Mark, I don't remember, but uh, it's been a long time. We said we should get together and do training. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. So we met here at NAB doing this. And then after NAB, we got together and we strategized about, okay, what, what can we do next? And we started then cranking out training on CD-ROM. And uh, of course, Final Cut Pro is huge. That's the creator of Final Cut. It's Randy Ubilos, who no longer works at Apple, but he's the one who, who came up with the whole, you know, skimming and, you know, magnetic timeline. Regardless of what you think about it, I mean, he, he made something very unique. Um, and then, uh, then from there, we, Mark and I kind of branched out into doing a lot of um, uh, first podcasts. We did a lot of podcasts with Alex Lindsay, We'd go, we'd go up to San Francisco and record video podcasts and we'd put them up and every week they'd, they'd be put up. But then YouTube started eclipsing that and we're like, well, we should just be doing them directly to YouTube. I'm giving you kind of a truncated you know, timeline here. But we, Mark and I have been doing pretty much focused on, on, on producing content for YouTube. We started seriously about five years ago and just like two, one to two videos a week. And we're up to, uh, ju- as of about five days ago, we just hit 80,000 subscribers. So and <laughs> it's been uh, quite the ride <laughs> for sure. Um, but so we, we have the YouTube channel and we're p- putting content, content up there uh, weekly. Mark just, Mark just posted an excellent video. You got to check it out. I'm working with ProRes Raw, uh, the Sony A7S and the Atomos digital recorder and Final Cut. And brings, he brings it all together in a really nice small footprint 37 minute tutorial it's on our on our, our youtube channel right now i, I got that uh, on my email yeah, today yeah. yesterday yeah so what you're looking at is kind of a uh, you know our, this is when well, we're not creating tutorials and plugins we're, we're spending a lot of time building our youtube channel which is where we find a lot of our customers uh, honestly because more more people go to youtube than any other site so here's a little bit of liberal training we we, we you know this is we, we have we have developers, a couple of developers that work for us, and we have editor. We have full time editor, and um, you know my wife does all of the book bookkeeping, and she does all the marketing. And so we're a small company, small foot, foot, footprint. We moved from Los Angeles about ten years ago, moved out to Arizona, out in the middle of nowhere, and you can see the picture on the left. So we just decided, oh, we I don't need to be anywhere specific. So why don't I move somewhere where I can have a horse? So that's what we did. We moved to a place where I had like five horses. And, and by the way, we got rid of them because I have a saying, and when, the day you sell a horse is the day you give yourself a raise. So um, we lived out there and, and that was great. And that's a picture of NAB about five, six years ago. And, and that's, our, that's our plan. 
And as you mentioned er, uh, at the start of this, um, our introduction, these are the three pieces of software that we are primarily focused on, Final Cut, Pro, Motion, and DaVinci Resolve. And that, that's, just, that's just the area that we focused on. And we kind of decided not to do, we, not to do the Adobe, not that you know, it's a bad product or anything, but just we just found that these are the three, these are the apps that we wanted to focus on. Um, let's see if there's, so uh, two more slides. Um, I, I want to kind of back up just a little bit. Mark, Mark and I are both creators. We're, we're producers. We love filming. We love creating things. We don't consider ourselves, tra we, we train for sure, but I think our first love is storytelling, just like you guys. Um, I've shot a number of documentaries. Mark shoots all kinds of amazing stuff. I, I'm a huge, avid, under, you know, uh, underwater video guy. I love to shoot underwater video. So the, the training thing is great, great, but what we really like to do is go out and, and create content. So um, there's some of the projects that Mark and I have worked on together. And I just throw that up there, you know, on our site, um, if you're interested in any Resolve training or Final Cut or any of the plugins, I put that code up there for you in case anyone wants to take advantage of it. So I'm going to stop Thank sharing. You. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. um, Mark, I, I thought you were the talkative one. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I thought that's the way it was all along, but maybe not. <laughs> oh, I, I can, I can go. <laughs> okay. Maybe you can, yeah, maybe you can camera, follow up with that, that one a little yeah, bit, give us a little more, uh, personal point of view on, on, you know, go, why don't you start where, where, where Steve did there a little bit? You guys met at NAB. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll back up just a little, little before that in terms of how we ended up coming together because sure. it's really kind of interesting how that happened. Because in, in 1999, when he started uh, his story there, I was the CFO of a software company in San Francisco. And Final Cut Pro had just come out. And uh, I like my job okay, um, but I wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't really passionate about it. I was really interested in filmmaking, but had always found it very intimidating. I would put a bunch of photography and writing. And when Final Cut came out, I was like, this is something I can do. So that, that blue G3 that he showed, I bought one of those. I got Final Cut. I got a little Canon Elora camera. And while I was still working full time, I would um, shoot anything I could. I'd go shoot a wedding, just shoot anything to get material to work with. And, uh, even at work, I'd be on, you guys might know Creative Cow, anybody? Yeah, oh, yeah. so I oh, yeah, sure. was on the Creative Cow forums all the time, devouring stuff. There's a, a wonderful gentleman who's since passed away named Ralph Fairweather, who used to be one of the biggest contributors to Final Cut there. I learned a ton from him and ended up actually meeting him and getting to work with him later. Um, but so I was kind of doing all this on the side. And uh, we had, a, I mean, this is a cool, this, I've been watching you guys, you know, today do all your stuff and it's just really great to see. And like, it reminds me because in San Francisco, the, the very first Final Cut Pro users group started in San Francisco uh, by Kevin Monahan and by it was Sharon Franklin and Lisa Siebold, um, right when Final Cut Pro originally came out like in 99. And I started going to those meetings and I just, it was this great community. And uh, I spent my weekend squirreled away trying to learn everything. And I started really with After Effects before, before Motion came out, I learned After Effects. And I made a little crazy thing and I showed it at one of those things. And Sharon saw it and she mentioned me to an editor at Peach Pit who asked if I would wanted to do a book on, on Motion when Motion just came out. Um, so that was, in terms of the big breaks, that was a really big break for me is just, by being passionately involved and interested in something and just putting myself out there, I got this opportunity to write the, uh, the Peach Pit Visual Quick Start Guide, which is like a 500 page book on motion when it first and came you out. You were and, what, you were what, 15 then? I mean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that sort of, that got it started. So I did that book um, and I started writing for some other publications and in, I don't know the whole timing of everything, but about 2005, I, um, I don't know how I got into NAB and, and working on the show floor. I think it was the same person Steve mentioned it at Apple. I was helping out at, in the um, NAB showroom floor. They had an educational 
open pit with 30 machines and they'd have people come in and do quick sessions. And I was one of the people who would help you learn how to use your mouse or whatever, just do whatever. And uh, I, I remember to this day, I was, I, I was in the back behind the stage and Steve was back in there in this little dark room where you're preparing. And I think Sharon Franklin was actually there trying to get some After Effects thing to work. And, and I started talking to Steve and, and he's like, oh, I do this training company. I'm like, oh, I do this motion. It's like, oh, we should, you know, that, that's where it all kind of came together right then. It's kind of the, the starting point of that whole process um, when we met there. And then, you know, Steve kind of laid out the history from that point on how that kind of thing developed. Well, you guys have formed a, a, an excellent team. Um, I, Mark, you're not um, swayed to buy a horse and move to Arizona? <laughs> uh, no, I've, I've been to Arizona and visited Steve there's many times. In fact, Steve used to have a, um, an entire green screen uh, studio in a separate barn basically a, you know, it was delivered to his house and he had it as a separate unit there at, the, at his previous house and you see like how my microphone suddenly appears Ooh. um so um yeah i'd go up there and we'd shoot we shoot a bunch of episodes there <clears throat> at the ranch uh but yeah i'm not i'm not a big horse person I, I it's too much too much responsibility i have a dog and it drives me crazy <laughs> yeah. um you know um uh back on topic a little bit um so you guys are certified by Apple. I mean, how did that all happen? Steve? Well, at, at one point, you know, we were the driving force between, you know, driving the certified program. There was a book, Mark referred to it. He wrote a book. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we take the book as a basis for teaching other instructors and they'd have to take a, uh, an exam and become, well, they have to pass it and then become certified in that and delivering that particular. So you helped. Um, get, you helped. Uh, it's not working with the uh, with the virtual. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you helped. You helped develop the curriculum for other people to become certified. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we did for a good wow. chunk of our time. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then, go ahead. So, um, so if somebody wants to become certified, if they have that teaching bug inside them what would be a good path for them to, to get to that level where they can um, create their own clientele? I'll let you answer that one, Mark. <laughs> I, I would say that there, there is no path. And I, I don't, I mean, the fact is that certification is not mean what it used to. Uh, it used to be, you know, it's the same way books don't, you know, a book, the cycle of making a book is like a year. And the cycle of software is like a month and they just, they don't mesh together. And the same thing with certification, there's just not, um, there's no longer, there might be some certification program out there anymore. I wouldn't put any weight on that whatsoever. Um, the way everybody learns right now is by what we do. You know, they watch a bunch of YouTube videos and sometimes they get frustrated and like, actually I need a structured approach and they'll buy a tutorial and be like, oh, I learn, can learn all this in a day instead of, you know, trying to piecemeal it together, but there's really no certification process for Fanaka Pro right now that would that I would recommend that would help you in a career. That's that's interesting because in my longevity, moving from a linear editor to I mean, I pretty much jumped on the Final Cut Pro wagon when three, and then they went from five to four, five, six real fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of when, when I said, okay, I can, I can edit on this. Cause I was a traditional linear editor for 10, 15 years, um, before that came on. Um, so maybe this is a good time. I have a poll, um, and this is going to, I'm going to launch this for everybody. So everybody, um, it's probably about enough time on that first poll. Perfect. Okay. That part's and I couldn't. I couldn't vote in that one. I'm. I'm a Final Cut 10 user who ran the the local uh, users group. I'm one of the few people who certified back time. I, the last time you could take a test. Okay. Like 10 two, 10 three. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> cool. So we got a mix. A good representation of some uh, Final Cut folks, some Premiere folks, and a couple of Resolve folks in the mix too, which is great. 
what I was hoping to do with, with the rest of the program is we, we definitely want this to be conversational and, and give um, all of the, the participants here a chance to ask questions, but I have a few sort of queued up to kind of get the, the wheels turning a bit, hopefully with some interesting topics and dive maybe a little bit deeper on some of the stuff that, that Steve and Mark, you guys talked about. So um, with that, um, I'm just going to start asking some questions and then um, Jeff and David help me keep an eye on, on the chat and if anything pops up there, feel free to, to toss them out and we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Uh, yeah, one last um, uh, technical issue. Um, I, I'm i now looking like I'm just a participant. I don't have any control. So something happened between the sharing between the two of you guys. Yeah, you My still, poll is still up. I can't take it down. You still uh, see as a host on our side. I think I think we'll just drive it from here, Tom. And Yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, I okay. just have a poll st sitting in the middle of my screen. Does everybody else? Uh, don't believe so. You should be able to click the little box and close out of that, Tom, hopefully. Or you're just frozen up and you just need to write it out as best you can. All right, fair enough. <laughs> um, so going going back, um, Stephen Mark, to sort of that that first process you referenced, you know, making you know VHS tapes and all that. Uh, give it, paint a picture a bit of what was the production process for uh, creating online training videos back back at that time. Back in the day, yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, there was very few tools to actually capture the screen back then. Um, I can't remember what I was using, but the tapes were really just, I took two beta SP cameras. Remember beta SP? Anybody? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> SP. Yeah. So One inch, beta come SP. On. Beta, hey, I think, yeah, beta should have won the consumer videotape wars, but there you go. So um, I had a camera beta SP on me and beta SP on my, on my screen. So really we just filmed, we filmed the screen, make sure the refresh rate was great. And then I brought it into a linear edit bay, Tom. I brought it into a, I cut it on a Grass Valley 200 sweatshirt to a D2 machine. That's how I cut it. Um, I, I love it. Output, D2. So I, I put it on D2 as a master and then I sent it out to be duplicated on VHS. And that's what I did. And then the online part, as the tools started developing for capturing, um, the, the quality wasn't good because the codecs aren't to where they are today. We don't have H.264 and H.265. We have the codex back there. Does anyone remember the Sorensen video or the, uh, uh, there's some other, there's some other codex that were really bad, but that's what we use. <laughs> and so, we, right. Yeah. <laughs> so we would up, up, we'd upload those and remember the quick time that wasn't, nothing was streamed. You'd put it up and they'd have to buffer enough to their computer to watch it. You remember, recall those days. So, yeah. so you'd embed a quick, you'd use an embed tag. You'd embed the movie they'd load it and then it would start buffering how many frames and then they could play. So that's really, that was what we did. And then at some point um, what the, we'd use that to preview our tutorials, but then we'd ship them a physical DVD. Um, and then ultimately we, then we all ended up with an online model. We've actually built up our own proprietary player to deliver content, streaming it at HD with chapter markers. You can make notes. So we, we've, we've evolved quite a bit because the tools, the tools are now there. So that's really the kind of the trajectory. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. And you're not de dealing with delivering physical, you know, copies of anything anymore. It's just- bits, Actually, bits actually, is, it's not true. Because some people, yeah. some people in cup, okay. you may, who, somebody out in the, way out in the, still wants a USB. So we'll ship them a USB with all their stuff on it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, 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 no optical media anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not burning a gold master disc and, and doing that whole yep. bit. So, yeah. oh, it's funny, we okay. still refer to master, we still refer to it as GM, mm -hmm. so even though it's nothing's put on a disc anymore. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Um, I was curious, um, you guys touched on sort of a lot on the, the video production side and on the uh, training side. How about on the, the plugin development side? I'm curious how you guys sort of saw, saw a niche there and decided to, to tackle that and what it was like. Um, so, so Mark, if you want to take the lead on that. Sure. I, I think the, the way that started is um, I was being pursued for a while by uh, FX Factory, which you may know is a, is a, it's basically like an app store for plugins. It's a platform for delivering plugins. And, and they were kind of constantly saying, you should do something, you should do something. It's an early market. And I'm like, I have my hands full. I just, you know, but I was doing so much stuff in motion and I was like, you know, I bet I could actually make something in motion because I'm not a developer. I don't code. I, I don't, you know, I'm not real technical, but I know motion really well. 
And uh, so I started messing around and I kind of developed something I thought would be kind of cool. And one time Steve was over, I don't know why you were, you were, you were here in San Francisco, Steve, I think it was in yeah. San Francisco at the time. And um, I showed him, I, and I was like, hey, look, I'm messing around with this. Thing. I don't really know what to call it though. And he's like, oh, those are call outs. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you're right. They're call outs. You know, hey, you want to like do this together? You know, it's like, yeah, let's do it together. So, I mean, that, that was our, our first plug in product was Ripple Callouts. Um, and it was very successful. And um, uh, it sort of launched like, hey, this is pretty cool. Like, this, here's, here's something that's different than tutorials because tutorials kind of have a life that like big up front and then, uh, you know, tails <laughs> off and kind of keeps going for a while. But then the new rev comes out and you need to update it. And, you know, tutorials are great and we've built a living on them, but this was like another thing to do that had a different model to it. And it was different thinking. Steve really loved doing the marketing and playing with him and telling me like he was great feedback of how to improve it and how to, you know, I get in the, in the, in the weeds and the details of all the trying to make stuff work. And then he's able to stand back and just like, well, wait, nobody's going to understand that. Or maybe you could do this. So we, we worked together really well and still do because um, that led to multiple plugins on that platform with FX Factory. But then we started actually over two years ago now, um, just about exactly two years ago, uh, doing some of our own Ripple Live plugins because we started this Ripple Live show. Um, and then we started doing the Ripple Live plugins that are a different type of plugin. They're a little a smaller bundle, a little lower cost to do some directly quick things. So we have these sort of two different sets of plugins um, but it's been a great fun business to do in conjunction with uh, all the Final Cut Motion and Resolve training. And a lot of the ideas come from, you know, I don't know where they came from those days, but today, you know, there's so much, I, I just, Facebook is, gives me so much information about what people want and what they were having trouble with for tutorials, for plugins, for our quick tips, for anything. There's just so many people posting, how do I do this? How do I do that? And like, oh, hey, I got an idea. So um, it kind of started from there, from just messing around with motion and seeing what's possible. And then we've been doing those for all together with at least 10 years of plugins now. Yeah, yeah. and also too with the plugins, we, one of the things that, that drives us is like, I want to do a plugin that I would use. Like, so Mark developed a plugin called Punch-Ins where you could, if you had a, uh, if you had a, um, a 1080 timeline, you just drop a this little title over it. It'll punch into you know punch in four times and punch out, kind of like what you see on YouTube videos all the time. And we were always using keyframes to do that. And now you just drop this thing on there, punches in, punches out, and we've at, we added arrows. And it's like I use that thing constantly. So we make plugins that we use all the time. I mean, I I came came up with a plugin idea like for for keyboard shortcuts that just pop on it. Now it's not a hugely not, not everyone needs to have like keyboard shortcuts, or, but show up on the screen. But for me to be able to knock, just quickly create a plugin that I could just put any keyboard from the Mac on the screen, that was huge. So really it's about um, finding ways that save us time. And then it, that, that, that kind of creates the idea. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like it's having that sort of entrepreneurial mindset where you're solving your own problems, but saying, Hey, this, this could be useful for others. We could make this a product, whether for free to give it away, to get people interested in our, our other stuff or, or, or for sale. Uh, Cause I've seen you guys do that regularly. Um, and, and also for folks who are, um, you know, maybe have clients um, that they wanted to help develop YouTube videos for um, that's all, you know, great examples of, you know, helping clients that we're working with think about what, what are they producing? What are they making that could be a product, you know, on, on its own in, in some sort of video format. Um, I'm, I'm curious with, you know, that, um, you know, 10 million views at this point that you guys are just about up to on, on YouTube and, you know, uh, over 800 videos and 80,000 subscribers. Um, that's, that's quite a feat of, of just consistency in terms of production and, and turning out the content. Um, and I think you kind of alluded to it earlier, um, just how that fits into your your business model, but also kind of who you guys are, your passions as, as just being educators and wanting to take those, those cookies down from the top shelf and get them, get them down to more people. Uh, I'm curious sort of what you've learned uh, from creating that, that much content that consistently over the years in terms of your, your production processes and your approaches to kind of keeping up with the changes to a platform like YouTube. 
Mark, do you want to answer that one first? I have my own well, answer give, for that. I just, I just one yeah. example that, that I'm thinking of is we launched, um, Steve had this idea, uh, I don't, maybe a year ago at the most, of doing these 60-second quick tips. In addition to our regular MacBreak Studio that you know can be 10, 15 minutes long, or the one I just did yesterday is almost 40 minutes long, but just mm -hmm. sort of like everybody, everybody's attention span is getting small and small, right? It's not a good thing, but take advantage of it. Like we do these 60-second quick tip things. And they've proved to be really popular. And one thing I love about doing them is it forces me to figure out how to communicate something in less than 60 seconds. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I push it too hard, like a 60 seconds, but people are like, what just happened? Like, they, I gotta watch it a few times, but um, it's a really great exercise in, in, in editing and just editing script. Because everything we do starts with writing. Like I would really character myself as a writer and a teacher more than a video person. I mean, I, like Steve, I love teaching. It's what really motivates me, but it all starts from writing. And these 60 second things start from how can you write it in a compact way that communicates just what you need to communicate. And it, to me, that's been a really useful exercise. And then, then the editing comes like, okay, how do we trim it down and save a few seconds? But the writing has to start out being exactly right for everything else to go. So, I mean, just an example of something, but you know, Steve can tell it like we just we have to produce so much content so regularly um, that you there's some things you just kind of um, have to develop some discipline around. Like, uh, uh, what's a, a per perfect is the enemy of good? Like, you know, at some point you just you got to get it done and get it out uh, because you've got ten more things to do. So it's it's challenging, but you want to keep the quality. It's a real thing. You want to keep the quality up, and you need to get it done. So it's tough. I don't know if you have a comment on that, Steve. Well, it's it's that, you know, age old triangle, you know, yeah. good, fast, cheap, you know, pick two, right? So we, we tried um, to make them good and fast, right? <laughs> but they're also cheap because they're free. Um, <laughs> thing is, is, the thing is, is what, we've, what I've learned most about you doing these YouTube videos is that, um, A, the production value has to be there. I mean, you could, you could throw stuff up and, you know, with a, you know, with your iPhone or a GoPro, whatever. And if the content's good, people watch it. I think ultimately, I mean, you have guys just talking to camera and they've, you know, 200,000 subscribers. So the content has got to be good. It's got to be content that people are interested in, but it's interesting in our business, you know, we're not, you know, like, we're not like a talking head where we just, we're talking about the news or whatever. We're, we're, we're filmmakers or storytellers. So we have to think in terms of sequencing and shots and graphics. And that takes a lot of time. I mean, Mark will tell you that the thing he just did, you know, took pretty much all week or longer to do. And, um, and you almost have to do to compete now with the other YouTube channels because we're competing with the likes of, you know, a Gerald and Dunn or a potato jet or, or an I Justine or you know, a lot of these YouTubers will you watch and they, they got very high production value. So, that's kind of expected now. That's like the minimum bar is your stuff has to sound good. It's got to look good. And you've got to be able to tell a story. And that's what's challenging is doing it consistently one to two or three times a week. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it gets sometimes it gets exhausting and you want to get off the hamster wheel. But um, there's no way out of it. You've got to continue to feed. I call it feeding the algorithm, feeding the algorithm. You, you know, YouTube's looking for that. You know, we, you know, the engagement, the comments, it's. This is all about what YouTube wants to recommend to people. And that, ta that takes a huge commitment. I'm just saying, don't, I'm telling you, if you want to do a YouTube channel, do it. But it is a, it, it, uh, don't, kid, don't fool yourself. It's a huge, huge time commitment. It took literally almost four solid years to get to 80,000 subscribers. I mean, and, and posting two to th at least two videos a week. Well, yeah. and that, I mean, that, and that started, uh -huh. that wasn't four years from the, that was four years after building a, a, a user base for many years before that. I do want yeah. to mention one other thing that, that for me makes this possible because if, if I were, a lot of these YouTubers are solo people doing their own thing and they may have help around them, but it's their, their thing. And I just, I would not be able to do that. The fact that Steve and I do this together and we haven't been physically together for a long time now, partly because of the pandemic and partly because we're able to do stuff remotely so much easier. But the fact of that we started out doing this together and as a duo and we push each other, you know, yeah. and we support each other and like, Oh, you're burned out. Take a day off. Or like I'll, I'll pick yeah. that up or yep. like, um, 
you know, this could actually be better. Like every time I, I send something to Steve, I post it for review. I, I get a sick sense in my stomach. Cause like, I don't <laughs> want, like, cause I know the first thing he's going to say, he's going to have some complaint about it. You know, Oh, this sucks. Oh, that sucks. And, and you know, and I'll get, I'll get really angry. Um, and like, what do you mean? You know, cause we use like frame IO for all of our comments and stuff. And he'll like, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to see him. I just, I'll read it and I'll get really mad and then I'll settle down. And it's like, yeah, okay, you're right. I'll fix it. You know? And I couldn't do that with myself. I wouldn't have the ability to do that kind of self censoring and self pushing kind of thing. So I think having somebody that you can work with in that respect is, is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a couple, I think a really couple of key things there uh, that would be super relevant for our group is a, having, having folks that you trust for, for feedback, for the really, really honest, direct feedback that you can take to heart and, and, and work with. Um, and then also uh, I think if I could paraphrase um, what, what uh, Steve said about um, being committed to the, to, to the YouTube channel, it's like, do it or, or don't there's no sort of doing it halfway because if, if you don't you'll never really get get the algorithm will not pick you up unless you are being consistent or you're really successful at kind of partnering with some of those other youtube tubers that you mentioned and i mean you you mentioned gerald undone in your pro res raw video mark so it's like you're making you're pointing to those communities because it's also a, a community of, of makers and, and collaborators too so it's not necessarily competition there's an opportunity to kind of grow together there too oh, I big say. time i mean that's yeah. that's why like we um we had actually known justine from years ago through through alex Lindsay. we were mm -hmm. both in his studio shooting something way before she was big news and um didn't know her really well but had met her and then we reached out to her a couple of years ago hey you know we know you're using final cut you think about doing something together and she was fantastic and so that's you know her, our, we have this i justine teaches Final Cut on the App Store. That's been a, a great thing and a great collaboration with her. So, you know, we love building those relationships. It's really the way to go. Is is all, everybody out here can push us to be better when they're competitors, and they can also be great to work with. Yep. Yeah. Um, kind of continuing along that same vein, um, and uh, some of the questions that I'm seeing here. Uh, do you have any? any metrics or sort of ballpark info that you'd be willing to, to share just as um, sort of a, a baseline for the folks here in terms of, you know, what is, how, how many views does it take to get a sale of, you know, uh, a training uh, program or, or a plugin or something like that? How, what's, what is the sort of not necessarily monetizing directly on YouTube and, and doing that, that ad stuff? Um, although I saw you're, you know, you're doing super chats on your live streams and things like that. So you are doing some kind of community donation stuff, but, but sort of what are you guys seeing the effectiveness of kind of YouTube driving folks to, to your, your products? Well, I think it's a huge driver of uh, sales to our site. Um, and really what you're doing with YouTube, anything, any business that's built on trust. And so if they trust you, if they trust that you, you're, you're delivering information they can use and you're helping them, then they're, they're much more willing to say, you know what, I really want to, 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 to sample their bigger, I get this, I get this, I get emails all the time. You know, I, you know, I, you really helped me with this and I decided to give you one, you know, five one of your tools and it's great. So it's really, it's really a philosophy I have about really how the universe works. It's like you, you give and it comes back to you. I'm, you know, a lot of people say, well, you're giving all this free content. Yeah, but that's who I am. I, I'm a giver. And I don't worry that it's going to come back or not come back because I just give and it just does. And so YouTube, uh, really has kind of been a platform for not so much uh, getting paid by Google. I mean, you know, we, we do make money off our channel, but it's, you know, it's, it's fine, but it's not, not that we couldn't, we couldn't make a living off of it, but it's not, that's not the point of it. The point is to let people, make people aware of, of what we are, what we offer, and, and to drive them uh, to our website where they can, you know, buy, buy the full training. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit. Um, speaking of sort of the the hamster wheel and and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, keep, <laughs> keeping current with you know, like you said, the the software cycle is you know is is super short uh, these days. It's you know there's new revisions happening all the time. Maybe a little slower on the Final Cut side as as a user than I would prefer these yeah. days. But but there's there's constantly you know a churn there. So what is your 
your sort of uh, approach, because you guys have been very fast in terms of, you know, turning around updates when, when stuff comes out, how do you sort of gear up for that? Uh, Cause I know we have a lot of folks here in, in town that for instance, they work with some of the big tech companies and they are working on, you know, NDA product releases for CES and they maybe have, you know, a one week or two week to like get into the lab and shoot something and turn around a video and get it ready for the show floor. How do you guys sort of gear up or approach uh, when, when you've got a big release coming up that you need to, to deliver content for? Um, Mark, do you want to answer that one? Without getting into any, any um, NDA territory yeah, yeah, or anything exactly. along those yeah, lines. Yeah, of course, we can't, we can't really, there's some stuff we can't really go into a lot of detail about. I mean, but I mean, basically it's just, we have, we're at the whim of the companies for whom we create products for. And we can't do anything about that. So when things drop, we hustle. Yeah. And it could be, you know, Apple does something at the same time as Black Magic does, and then we're in a crunch, you know, and we we ramp up extra help uh, when we need to to get it. It's all hands on deck and just like crazy. I mean, um, I'm personally on a huge backlog right now because I've got a massive uh, Da Vinci Resolve Advanced Color Correction update that I'm working on. That's, that's huge. It's a six hour <laughs> tutorial. It's 60 lessons, it's yeah, 60 yeah, lessons. Wow. And it has to be, it has, to, it's, you know, it has to be completely redone because the interface looks a little different and people are like, well, wait a minute, that button isn't in there, in there in the current version. So you have to like reshoot the entire thing, even though maybe 20% of it's actually new material. Um, I, I don't know how to answer the question because you just, you just have to hustle as best yeah. you can to make it happen. It's, it's just like any freelancer, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a boom or bust. You're either like totally overwhelmed or you're destitute. And it's, it's very hard to smooth things out and, <laughs> yeah. you know, do the work when you don't want to. I'm, uh, I'm curious, maybe a better way to kind of come at it is have you guys developed any sort of uh, approaches using metadata or tagging or anything of those things? Because, you know, that's, you know, a great feature in the final kind of the browser to help you when you do have to go back and make revisions? Is there is there anything that you guys have learned as, as, as something, a lesson along the way to help you then when you have to go back and revise or suggest hustle when the time comes and, and, and crank it out? Well, we, we both have our core competence. I mean, we're both editors, we're both storytellers, and usually it's a divide and conquer scenario if we're working on a tutorial. As Mark mentioned, we're, we utilize Frame.io quite extensively. I can't even imagine doing what we do now without Frame.io. Uh, it's just, I can it's just so helpful. I mean, I use it every day and Mark and I, we post, you know, he'll post an edit and he'll, he'll send me an XML of his timeline and I'll open it up. Boom. There's his edit. I make changes. I export an XML. Boom. We, uh, this of course assumes we have the same media on our respective systems, but, but assuming we do, and even now with pro it's really great with Final Cut's proxy workflow. We don't even have to upload, you know, huge ProRes files. We get out, you know, quarter, quarter size H.264 movies which Final Cut plays back just fine. And then we relink to the optimized media later, or the, the original media later. So the, the we're not hindered in any way now, um, even on big projects, because we can just, we can literally upload hundreds of H.264 clips or HEVC clips or what, what have you, small footprint files, work with them. We both have them and we're just swapping XMLs. And it's it, it works out really, really well. And we also use, you know, the, what we like, I use the, the Final Cuts marker feature a lot. I'll put markers with comments. And so he'll open up and see comments. Everything I need to change or use it right there in the timeline. All right. And just go through and check things off. So works really well. Nice. Yeah. Um, the remote collaborative workflows these days with tools like Frame.io or Whipster or, or what have you are, are fantastic. And even the direct integration into the panels in, in Premiere and Final Cut really yeah. kind of facilitate that kind of behavior. So it sounds like not, not so much preparing and trying to kind of minimize the amount of work, but just get better at doing the work faster when it comes is, is probably the lesson. <laughs> That's great. Um, so we've talked a lot about software and editing, but I know you guys have also kind of dipped a toe into some other production topics as well. You've done some tutorials, uh, especially around some of the um, uh, hardware tools like the Blackmagic A10 Minis, um, mobile, you know, audio and video development, yeah, the uh, was that one of the mini Ripple? Um, it's, a, it's a speed editor from speed editor. Yeah. Black Magic. That's right. Yeah. So so yeah, you guys have diversified. So it's not just you know software training; it's also some kind of production tips and and hardware uh, tutorials. Um, how do you guys decide which of those to to focus on? Is it just 
um, things that are interesting to you or that you're actually using or that you see maybe a, a niche in the market that folks aren't talking about? How do you, how do you go about that? Well, I, 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 that poll was, the poll that you showed was huge to me. I already looked at it and I go, that's been, those numbers are great. DaVinci is down here. That means that there's this huge growth, growth potential for DaVinci. You know, um, we're hearing more and more people, um, really interesting. Um, Black Magic's doing some great things. So I, I look at it and I go, oh, there's a whole bunch of people that still need to learn how DaVinci and, and see how awesome it is to do some stuff. So um, with in terms of like what we pick to, to focus on, as Mark said it earlier, you know, you, which you read Facebook, you we watch a ton of videos, tons of them. And I see, I, I look at like metrics, like whose videos being watched and why. And, and if, and if, and I don't want to copy that, but maybe we can have our own unique take on that. That the other, and then we're going to, you know, so in a way we're kind of piggybacking on the, on the popularity of the particular subject. I mean, look, there've been videos done on ProRes raw to be sure. I mean, Gerald and Dunn has done them and um, uh, the DP journey has done them, but, you know, we have our own take on it. So that Mark did a, you know, you know, in collaboration with Atomos, they decided to do our unique thing. So it just made sense. He has all the hardware and he has a passion to, to talk about it. So why not do that subject? So it's just kind of a more of a, it's a more uh, an organic approach to our subject matter. Like another good example was uh, Apple came out with the iPhone 12 with HDR. Nobody understood like what's going on with the Dolby. How come when I put the clip in my timeline, it's all washed out. What the heck? I, so I just, so I'll look, I look at that and I go, Mark, there's an opportunity. We need to educate people. So I, I didn't even have an iPhone 12 at the time. And Mark was in Belize. He didn't have one. So we contacted Justine and said, Justine, give us, send us, because she already did a video on the iPhone 12, like before it even came out. <laughs> anyway, so send us some clips. So we took all of her clips and then we presented how to work with HDR clips in Final Cut. So there's another perfect example of how we would choose a subject. But it's uh, it will be it has to be stuff that we're really interested in. I mean, I I would not do a review of a piece of hardware or software if I wasn't excited about it. it just it, it it wouldn't come through. Like this whole um this whole you know this Ninja and the A7S III. I, I this I love this gear. It's just really exciting to me. So I'm totally yeah. love talking about it. I just I wouldn't. So what we what we don't do a lot of is like. You know, some YouTubers are all focused on, hey, somebody sent me all this stuff and I'm going to tell you about it and then I'm going to send it back. Like, we, didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. like we, we talk about stuff that we use and that we yeah. actually do and are excited about. We aren't reviewers. It's sort of like, you know, here's stuff that we use and here's what we do and here's our workflow. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious as well if maybe um, uh, you've seen uh, that that same shift in, in your customers as as I think we're all experiencing as as uh, individuals in the industry where um, folks are expected to if what they were you know strictly editors or motion graphics folks before they're expected to know a little bit or to be able to do some shooting on their own or you know understand how to do you know lighting and microphones and basic production tasks so uh, was that also kind of what you guys saw and decided to kind of follow follow suit as as um, you were hearing that from from your customers. We've done some production tutorials in the past. We have done tutorials on lighting. We've, we, Mark and I did a whole DSLR. And it's not that we don't like them. We just found that they literally took 10 times longer than software training. With software, you capture the interface, you talk about it. With hardware to, uh, production, it's a totally different beast. I mean, you have to shoot just boatloads of B-roll. I mean, really good B-roll. And so you're telling, and you know, you're like, well, I just said all this stuff. I have one shot to cover it. What I'm going to just keep that shot on for like 70 seconds. So no, it's all, it's always about like it, it. Doing a production tutorial, I've discovered, just takes so much more time and thought and planning because there's you're telling a story and you have to have a lot of imagery to support what you're saying. So and, and it's not that I'm opposed to it. It's just that, like Mark said, it's got to be a subject that we're like you know super passionate about. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we really, I mean, we could certainly, we both have a ton of production experience. We, we can do more, but we found that they just take a tremendous amount of time to, to produce. So if we could figure out how to do it in a way that, you know, would cut the time and we, we might consider it, but we got so much on our plate, with just software and plugins that, and YouTube that, that it's just kind of, it's just kind of sitting over here, like on a shelf right now. Well, especially if you look at the attention span, there was a there was a great YouTube video of a I forget his name now, but he was 
basically wanted to hire an editor and he's a big YouTuber, does a ton of stuff, does really top end stuff. And this he, guy he edits. You through, he, what's that? This guy edits. Uh, Isn't it? Not, Wasn't it I'm him? not sure, but he he, he, he he hired an editor off of like Fiverr or one of those, right? Yeah. And he, he went through, here's, here's all the top yeah. reels that I watched and what I liked about him. And he basically would say like, he's watching something. If something doesn't happen about every five to 10 seconds, he's bored. Hmm. Like, hey, there's been talking for five seconds. Nothing's happened. You know, there hasn't been a cutaway. There hasn't been a graphic. I'm bored. And like, like sure. this, this, that's what I was concerned about this YouTube video I just put up. Um, it's 37 minutes long, but it, there's parts of it. I had so much to talk about. And if I were really to keep a lot of B-roll in there, I would have to work another month on it. And I mean, that was easily three weeks of work, just the writing and collecting the footage. And there's so much more to actually make it um, denser with information, with more graphics and things like that. I could easily spent days more putting a lot more material in there. That's why I'm amazed at some of these folks. I don't know how they get by. Like this guy, DP Journey, you should check him out if you haven't before, because he did a, um, an excellent breakdown of ProRes Raw that's different than what I did, but he had tons of excellent charts and graphs. But it's like, oh, that had to take him, you know, that's the kind of work that we put into our tutorials that we sell that have to be like that but he's putting the stuff out for free and it's like how do you make a living <laughs> yeah. it's just outstanding and and i just don't it's too much no. yeah i'm i'm curious uh, if what we're seeing too and maybe you guys are have this in your your analytics from from youtube it seems like there are sort of like there's the the really short videos that people are looking for just something really quick and then there are the like the deeper dives where people want to kind of dive in and go, you know, 40 minutes with ProRes Raw or watch Philip Bloom review the new Sony camera for an hour and a half or like whatever it is. It seems like, you know, there, there's room on both sides of the spectrum potentially for, for folks, depending on what their sort of interest or appetite is. Um, uh, moving on here. Uh, oh, wait, great question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. No, no, these are great questions. They're, oh, they're good. Really Good. Um, we've got a few stuff in the chat. I'm, I'm glad to see that the chat is also just sort of uh, having some side discussions about, you know, what is a real uh, NLE? What is a real video editing tool, which is fantastic to kind of dispel some of those myths in terms of, you know, just because you don't use one of the three that we had in the poll doesn't mean you're necessarily, you're not an editor, you're not making videos because you're not using the right tool. Hopefully, I think a lot of what you guys have done over the years shows, you know, that it's, it's, look at what you can do with these tools. You know, this is great. This is democratization of, of the technology. So I um, want to start to kind of cast our minds towards the future a little bit with our last sort of like 10 minutes or so here before we start to, to wrap things up. And just wanted to pick your brain since you guys have been steeped in this for, you know, since, uh, you know, Final Cut 1 and going back to the early days of NEBs and all the, those industry um uh, meetings. Uh, where do you see the future uh, for sort of professionals in our industry as, you know, video makers, whether we're focusing on the production side or the editing side, where, where do you see this all continuing to evolve and go over the next, you know, five, 10 years? I'm going to think about that. Well, we're seeing, <laughs> well, one thing that I, what we're seeing right now, especially, um, in news media is, is well, we're seeing a lot of a, a shift to a lot of independent uh, channels, independent uh, uh, news gatherers and news shows, independent entertainment channels. And, and honestly, it's, it's kind of interesting to watch. Um, corporate media is kind of imploding right now, to be honest with you. It's just like, they don't know what to do. They're freaking. This is what I'm seeing. And I think there's gonna be a ton of opportunity for, for us creators and storytellers and these smaller space and finding these little niches where we become kind of either subject matter experts or we work with, you know, here's an example. I'm, I work with a, a, a guy at Disney and he started a company called the Space Channel. He's like, all he wants to do is cover stuff with NASA and outer space and, and um, you know, uh, what's, his, um, what's his name? Elon Musk and all, all anything to do with space. And he's going to create an entire like, series of YouTube shows ba based around that. He's focused on it. And, 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 and no network would give, it, give him any money for that per se. He's just doing, he's, he's bootstrapping it. And, and I see a lot of, that's where I see a lot of things moving and kind of like the, you know, small footprint, you know, film crews and small, uh, small production companies producing stuff that looks like it was produced by, you know, network television. Uh, now, now the, 
there was a time where there was a difference between you know network quality and you know YouTube. Now, now it's all the same. We're all we all shooting with the same cameras now. I mean, we got YouTubers that are shooting with you know red cameras and you know it, like it's it's just amazing. So, so there's a, there's kind of a great democratization of tools, and there's now a democratization of how we we can now interact with our audience directly directly now. We don't. Anyway, I, I don't, I'm kind of rambling on this a little bit, but I just I see a ton of opportunity, but but I, I see a huge seismic shift away from corporations running, uh, having a, a literally gatekeepers for media. I mean, we're, we're seeing it crumble. You know, you may not agree with me, but I see it crumbling. Yep, uh, I think we're definitely seeing seeing a lot of the same and opportunity for folks in our industry that that yeah. can help people. Yeah tell their story, get their message out, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, looks like we, Mark may not be handy at the moment, but uh, if you can both jump in, uh, sort of what are the new tools or, or techniques or technologies that you guys are most excited about that are the, the, the new things that have come across your radar that you, you just can't get enough of right now? Well, one of the things I want to dip my toe into is augmented reality. I think that's going to be something we're going to see a lot of. I know, you know, this is something that Apple's been working on a lot. We don't know anything about what they're going to be showing, but, you know, the idea of augmented reality apps in the future and being able to integrate augmented reality. And, you know, I, we're still kind of, again, the beginnings of that, but I think that's an area that I'm, I'm kind of excited about, actually. Um, you know, what we can do with our phones and, you know, uh, putting things in space and, you know, the, the, um, I, it's just, I, I, <laughs> this one area I want to spend more time researching, but I see a lot of, I, I see the future is that, you know, so that's one of the things I'm excited about um, is that I see future wise is, and frame IO is working on this. And it's the idea of uh, production in the cloud where you're shooting and your stuff goes right up to the cloud metadata is up there. It's just, completely bypasses the DIT cart and all of the stuff that happens, you know, right there on set and just goes straight to the cloud with all the metadata, with lots of with And it's the idea of using the cloud as kind of a repository for your dailies and, uh, you know, your things go up to the cloud and you're working off the cloud. Uh, I, I see that is also something that's coming big time in the next, you know, five to 10 years. No, fantastic. I think there's yeah a lot in that space that's going to be interesting. Uh, I signed up for the beta of Camera to Cloud. We we have one of those old Teradek cubes at work and a Sony FS7. Yeah. And as soon as they turn that on, we're going to start trying it out and see how it goes. So uh, I'm I'm with you there for sure. Um, I think probably a last question from me, and then we'll start to to kind of transition mm-hmm. to wrap up. And also, uh, if you could uh, have, uh, I want to give you a chance to reiterate that uh, discount code for folks and, and sort of what the, the, the details are around that. So have that handy, sure. uh, Steve, if you yeah. would. But just sort of one last kind of big picture question. Where do you see the future of training uh, in this industry going? Uh, where, where, where is the, the puck going that you guys are, are trying to skate to? Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really an interesting question. I, I think there's always going to be a need for quality training. There's always going to be something that people need in terms of bringing their, uh, their skill levels to a certain plateau. Um, what's interesting, you know, all the, what I call the app world, you know, with apps, I mean, you don't need any training and they're pretty, they, they work the way they work and you can do, do things. Um, I look at, I look at a software like DaVinci Resolve and, and, and it's very, it's, it's complicated in a lot of ways. So, and, and it requires explaining. So I, I, I don't see training necessarily going away, you know, unless, no, I just don't see it. I just see, I see more training actually coming down the pike. I mean, cause I'm still absorbing all this new, this new technology. And uh, you know what? I, I, I see, I see it as growth for us. Uh, I don't see my, you know, in terms of a company, you know, I, I remember, remember Linda back in Linda.com back in the day. And now they're, yeah purchased by LinkedIn. I, I don't see myself becoming one of those. I mean, I still, I like my job, but I still, um, I still want to do other things. I want to spend time with my grandkids. I want to go scuba dive on it. So I, I don't, I, I don't have this grand scheme to like take over the training world. That's, that's not what I want to do. I mean, someone else could do that, but I, I see myself busy for, you know, certainly the next 10 years doing this stuff. So 
Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mark. I uh, ho- hope you're still with us, at least listening in. Um, so let's start to, to go to, to wrap up, Jane, and get ready for your final comments. But Steve, if you would, uh, please give us that code again one more time and let us know sort of what the, what the details are around that, who, who that's right. valid I'm gonna, for any time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen if you don't mind. And uh, do you see it right there? Uh, yeah, we should be seeing that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And valid so for the, valid for just the folks okay. in this meeting. For yeah. So yeah. So this is our newsletter. How do you how do you want to? You can actually it? sure you could use <laughs> your entire newsletter if you want. So let me just be clear. So basically, this code San Diego dash thirty. You can use. Um, let me go to our web. Let me go to our website here. You can use those on any of our Final Cut, Motion, or DaVinci Resolve tutorials, with one exception. Uh, the, the exceptions are our bundles, which are already like 30% off. So you'll try, if you try to buy like a bundle that includes like three or more, the, the code won't work. But any, any single tutorial that code will work for, either on DaVinci, Resolve, Motion, or Final Cut, it'll also work for our plugins. So we, like I, we talked about this earlier, that we have these plugins that Mark and I use all the time, and you can also use that code for any of these, these plugins um, on our site as well. So yeah, plugins, tutorials, and then uh, excluding bundles um, or, or, or tutorials that are, are currently on set. So hopefully that answered it for you. Fantastic, that's great. Um, any expiration date on that we should uh, include? Um, no, no, I'm not gonna put an expiration date on it. I think I'll just leave it open-ended. And you know, if you, someday you put it in, doesn't work, just email us and say, hey, I got this code, you know, we'll still honor it. I, I, don't, I don't see any need for it to let, let people know that that's available. They can avail themselves to that. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, that's uh, a great resource for uh, our folks. And thank you for your time, both both you, Steve, and, and Mark, for, for joining us this evening. Uh, great, great information. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you guys. Um, so with that, I think I will bring in uh, Jane here to wrap us up. Thanks, everyone. It was, thanks, it was a Steve. Pleasure. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Steve. Uh, Tom, Steve. did you have any final remarks before I sign us on out of here? I'm just... Um, um, you guys are be a big deal, okay? <laughs> and the fact that I I sent an email to you through support and you came back and we're here today, I really, really want to thank you. Yeah. Well, good. It just means we want we monitor our support. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. So yeah, good companies thing. don't. No, it's yeah. it's great. No. And it feels it's it it feels real good. It feels real good. Thank you so much. Good. All right. Well, thanks. And, you know, before I go, can I just say that I, you know, I like Zoom and I was telling you this, Tom, but I'm, I'd much rather be do this in person. Um, so like afterwards, we can like go have a beer or whatever. And uh, so if it wasn't for the COVID, you know, it's only a six hour drive. My, I have, my family is in Los Angeles, so I'd make a you know, point to do a to do an in-person um, user group at some time when, you know, everybody feels safe to meet because um, I prefer. I, pr- I prefer face to face than than Zoom. I mean, this is great, but there's something and, about being and, in the same room. And this this group drinks beer, okay? <laughs> Got the coasters yeah. and everything. We've given out coasters, okay, <laughs> as part of our swag. <laughs> yeah, well, that'd be great. So that's we'll have very that true. Future. Well, and Steve, we would love to take you up on that. When we can start meeting again in person, uh, we're now on, what, 13 months of these remote meetings, I think. And uh, we're ready to go back to in-person, too, just as soon as it's safe to do so. So thank you for that offer. That would be a great, great event for us to have you and and possibly Mark join us uh, more locally and in in person. So... um, I, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mark, for a really enlightening discussion. I really learned a lot. So, so thank you for that. And, and for making it so much fun too, you know, who, who knew training <laughs> plugins could be so interesting. And I, I don't know about anyone else, but I kind of really enjoyed the walk down memory lane too, to a bunch of technologies that, that, that many of us have had a chance to live through and live with. Um, Are you guys, is it going to be available on YouTube for your group or is it going to be private or? Uh, it, it, it will be available on YouTube. We've been streaming live and uh, it'll be posted permanently on the SD Media Pro's YouTube channel. 
So might be interesting. The reason the reason I I find it interesting is I mean I could see myself directing some of our customers because I I've never really told my story in a formal way before. Uh-huh. I mean I have these slides so but not in a kind of a structured way and like told our company so I you know there there'd be a few people might be interested in it um, just you know just for that and the questions were very very good. They listed a lot of a lot of you know cool cool stuff. So yeah, there'll yeah, be a yeah, link I'll to it right on the homepage. You. Very good. Yes, Steve, we'll be able, we'll make sure that you've got that direct link so that you can please direct people to our website. We love Very it. Well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, lovely people. And thanks for having me on. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch in uh, the future. Absolutely. So. Just a couple of reminders as we wrap up Wednesday, April 7th, we've got the event with Sony Wednesday, April 28th is our next meeting with Scott Valentine talking about the good old days of family ties and also his new streaming platform. Um, Resources from tonight's meeting are always on our website at sdmediapros.org. Any links or mentions tonight and from all of our meetings are on our website. And I think my greatest message tonight is thank you for being part of SD Media Pros. We really appreciate having you here with us. Uh, We're running a special on membership. It's only $50 a year for new members or renewals that are made by June 30th, 2021. So if you're not currently a member, um, join us. And um, we will see you again next month. Thank you very, very much um, on behalf of me and the board of directors. And we'll see you next month. We'll see you on April 7th. And then we'll see you again on April 28th. Good night, everybody. 